All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel after a uh, a bit of a sabbatical. I have been in a sunny Europe for the last five or six weeks, and this is my return to the action today. Uh, I've come back a little bit fatter, a little bit happier, a little bit more tanned, and certainly a lot poorer than I was about six weeks ago. Uh, but I'm back, got back to Perth last night, and uh, yeah, it's time to get back into making videos because I haven't left myself much time. Arriving back, you know, halfway through the first week of the finals, uh, I have a lot of catching up to do before I can start making videos. But today I thought I would ease back into it and start with a topic uh, that is obviously close to home, talking about the Eagles and reviewing their season generally. Bear with me, I am going to get back to the general football content very soon, uh, but obviously I have missed a lot of football, so I'm going to do some catching up. Uh, and then, you know, by next week we'll be back into the general footy content that I thought I'd make it easy on myself and just talk about the Eagles because I have been following that a little bit more closely uh, what with the time difference I didn't get to see a lot of footy over there so Europe was really good though uh, I've come back uh, feeling pretty fresh and therefore uh, somewhat motivated to make some videos again uh, before the, the cruel reality of life uh, hits me over the next couple of days when I return to work but at the moment uh, feeling good again and uh, hopefully it will be a good final series ahead so far it's been bloody good we've had two amazing games uh, but we'll unpack all of that over the next coming weeks uh, as I get more and more acclimatized to football once again. But we'll talk about the Eagles today in this particular video, just sort of unpacking um, the awful season that 2022 was. This will probably be the last Eagles video I make up until, uh, you know, the trade and draft period, guys. So if you're not particularly interested, hang tight. Uh, but I thought, you know, it's, it's good to sort of unpack the season that was from an Eagles perspective, because this will probably go down as the worst season that certainly I've ever seen and probably has ever been in the history of the Eagles. And that's backed up statistically we won just the two games 20 losses that is our worst season on record and we are incredibly lucky that we somehow didn't win the wooden spoon there just happened to be a worse team this year in North Melbourne and you can certainly make the case that North were better uh, certainly over the last six weeks um, they really lifted as well and thank God we avoided the wooden spoon we had two wins all year somehow beating Collingwood who could win the flag uh, with that really, really, you know, half half a side we really beat them with, um, but we genuinely played well. And then later in the year, we also beat Essendon, who were going through a bit of a purple patch at the time. So the two wins were good wins uh, in games we played well in, but those were pretty much the only bright uh, lights across the entire season. It was exacerbated by COVID and injury, if you recall back uh, early parts of the season. We had top-ups in round two, and, you know, we we're unlucky to have top-ups in that game because we probably would have beaten North. Uh, all things considered, not that it really matters. But overall, despite COVID and despite the injuries, it was probably a good year to have those sort of circumstances because we weren't really going to be relevant anyway. So even the fact that we had a fairly good excuse to lose some of the games in the way we did early in the year, obviously when we got our players back and even when we were relatively, I'll say somewhat fit, not completely fit, uh, we were obviously nowhere near it. In fact, we kind of got worse there. So overall, not too much of an excuse. It probably was just the difference of us winning three or four games instead of two. I do recall uh, at one and three at the start of the season, once uh, once we had a few COVID-affected rounds and we beat Collingwood, there was genuine excitement, at least for me, or at least enthusiasm, maybe not excitement because we we're pretty much... Uh, up against it to, to make finals anyway, but at one and three, we'd just beaten Collingwood. There was belief that, you know, we could start to play some better footy and really get something out of this year, but unfortunately, it would get way worse before it would get better. I think it was that Friday night home game against Sydney where we had a host of, you know, senior players back on the side, uh, and the score was 50 to zero before we'd even really noticed that the opening siren had gone, uh, and then obviously a huge loss to Richmond a few weeks after that. Uh, that really cemented us as having, you know, a really, really terrible season. I will say, though, at the start of this season, if you'd said the Eagles weren't going to make finals and you'd ask me, where would you like to finish? Where's the best spot for you to finish uh, for it to be constructive into future seasons? I would have said second last is probably the best place to finish. You don't get the wooden spoon, but you get that draft capital. You get that really good draft position. And obviously, well, I think back to 2021 where finishing ninth, I thought was the worst possible outcome. We finished that year as one of the poorest teams in the competition, probably the poorest actually. But because we'd finished ninth, there was still this sort of like, you know, unknown factor about where we really sat as a list. Whereas now we actually have a really good indication of where we are at as a list. So there's some positives there. So the contrast between 2021 and 2022, 
I actually think 2021 was worse in some ways. So not so much the way we played, but just the fact that we still finished ninth, you know, didn't have a good draft pick and uh, there was still some sort of belief that we were, you know, around the mark, but obviously uh, we were nowhere near it. And that's not me just trying to uh, turn finishing 17th into a positive, like it's something I wanted. I'm not saying that. Uh, but I just genuinely think we had a lot more answers out of 2022 than we did in 2021. And therefore, I think there's a bit of a silver lining. So in this video, I'm going to run through some negatives and positives for you guys uh, based on the season that was. Uh, before we get into it, I will acknowledge our sponsors, Manscaped, who do still sponsor the channel. Uh, I told them I was going to wait for Europe, but I told them I would be back in September. You can still get a really good discount with them, 20% off and free shipping. You just have to use the code TRUEFOOTY20 when you check out. I know that I've just come back from Europe, wasn't doing a lot of manscaping. This this little half man beard is looking a bit gross for a start and you can just imagine what the rest of my body looks like. So uh, I'm definitely going to get back into the manscaping game and uh, you can use the code TRUEFOOTY20 if you want to... Um, not join me, but also Manscaped as well. Cool, so we'll, we'll rattle off some negatives uh, to start the season. Where do you really begin? I think the first one primarily is the fact that it was our worst season statistically and uh, quite possibly, yeah, the worst football performances, you know, over a long period of time that I've ever seen from this football club. And I was there for 2008 and 2010 where we actually won the spoon. I think this side was worse, to be honest. And I think there's some mitigating factors. Uh, I think fitness was obviously really, really poor and it was exacerbated by injury. But even when the players came back, you could tell they weren't really, it was like they were running on quicksand a little bit. So that's one issue the Eagles need to sort of isolate and, and try and fix, you know, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, uh, the amount of injuries, but not only injuries, but repeat injuries. Some players repeatedly doing hamstrings or calves or uh, groins in, in the case of Edwards and Yo. There was about four or five players who kept doing the same injury. Petrocelli, Rioli, Shuey, Yo, as I touched on. Luke Edwards sort of came in and kept going back out. So not only did we not have players available, but when they came in, they didn't quite look ready. And uh, it's hard to know how much blame to put on the, the strength and conditioning or, you know, the general high performance department of the of the side uh, at the Eagles. But uh, either way, I think that's that part of the, the football department needs a bit of a shake up. And it sounds like that is what's happening. Uh, as a result, you know, the efforts were so inconsistent across the year. And again, I don't know how much to put down to fitness, but there's also probably a mental aspect when your side's like, you know, one and eight, you know, halfway through the season, how hard are you really running back the other way to defend a turnover? Like, it's hard to pinpoint what was the start of this little domino effect, but either way, we can generally sum up that, you know, the effort was poor, the fitness levels were terrible. From a preparation standpoint, we didn't seem great, and we also just copped some really bad luck. We barely saw Elliot Yo, Nick Nat, and Rioli, who were at times playing some really good footy. Gov comes in, plays his best month of footy since probably 2018, uh, and then, you know, gets his ribs crushed or whatever it was. That's just bad luck. But, you know, not not even seeing someone like Allen all year, Tom Cole, Dom Sheed played one game and there's, that's only the tip of the iceberg for the injury list for the Eagles this year. I know I'm harping on a lot about injuries this year and, and I don't even so much mean it as an excuse for the performances. In fact, I don't really at all. But the other side of that is we missed getting games into what I would consider the, sort of the key cogs of the next generation. So someone like Oscar Allen, touted as a future captain, potentially our best player in five years time, uh, didn't even play a single game this year. I'm a big fan of Luke Edwards as well. Well, barely saw the guy because of a repeated groin injury. Uh, who else? Xavier O'Neill and Petricelli kept getting injured. Where the, they're the sort of guys you want to in that 21 to 23 sort of age bracket you want to see take the next step, they barely got in the park. Campbell Chester comes in, our first round draft pick, busts his ankle in the opening preseason game as soon as he gets the ball. And, uh, you know, in a year where the results aren't going our way and we want to get games into kids, to miss all those players, and, and especially Campbell Chester, our number one or first round draft pick, for him to not even play at all, uh, it's just been a serious shit sandwich this year. Another negative is the fact that our ruck division was massively exposed this year. We took a bit of a risk going in light. I think with ruck stocks, we took Stranatica, uh, I think as a supplemental pick, you know, in the preseason so that, you know, we didn't even cover that gap in the uh, trade and draft period last year. We sort of waited to this year to pick him up for whatever reason. He's retired mid-year. Don't know exactly what's happened there. Maybe he's cracked the shits or what, I don't know. But, you know, with Nick Nat going down for most of the year, we uh, had a ruck division exposed of Bailey Williams and uh, and Callum Jamison. And, you know, those guys are young, so they're not, not really any criticism on them. But obviously, that that's probably the, the most... Probably the weakest ruck combo I've ever seen uh, in terms of how AFL ready they are. Um, they just got annihilated every week, and it was it was massive when Nick went down. 
In addition to missed games from key players, um, you know, that we've just talked about at length, some of the stagnation from the players actually playing was really disappointing. Andrew Gaff probably had his worst season at AFL level. Um, there's talk that he's playing injured, but either way, you know, normally even when Gaff's not playing well, you rely on him getting the ball 28 times, but there were games he just, you know, had 15, 16, 21. Uh, I'm not too sure what's happened there, but that for me was a pretty disappointing aspect of the season. Then some younger guys sort of, who should be coming into their prime. In particular, I'll nominate Liam Duggan and Josh Rotham as two players with a lot more potential than they're currently showing. Liam Duggan, another potential future captain. Uh, I still am hopeful that he can realize his potential. Was really good in 2020, but uh, his radar was off this year. Lots of turnovers. And Josh Rotham as well, you know, played in the back line. And I don't know whether he's coached this way or whether he's just become so low on confidence, but for a guy who's a great kick and one of the fastest on the list, he's a repeat offender for just grabbing the ball and kicking it backwards and not wanting to make mistakes. And I think those guys taking a step back was really noticeable this year in the absence of, you know, good playing established players. Not very articulate, good playing. Continuing on that thread of, you know, players who have stagnated over the last couple of years, you know, since the Tim Kelly trade, the Eagles haven't had, you know, access to draft picks, okay? I don't, don't want to get into the, the Kelly trade specifically, but what we've done in that time is trade, you know, pick 48, pick 52 for some, you know, role players at other clubs who were sort of forced out, uh, who had a bit of potential to come on. And I thought this was a good strategy. And I'll nominate Alex Witherden, Petrovsky Seaton, Zach Langdon as players with a bit of potential that didn't quite realize it at their former clubs. And unfortunately, all of them are just kind of in a, a no man's land at the moment. I think Witherden may not be offered a contract. He'll probably be delisted. Uh, and that's a guy who I think has some potential, but probably just doesn't have the right attributes for what we need at the moment with our back line. He's kind of a a non-accountable defender without speed, but he's a really good kick. And I just think, you know, in a side where Shannon Hearn is already playing amazing and is a great defender and at 36 years old is a way better player than Witherden, it's just not the right club for him. Uh, Langdon hasn't really produced at AFL level and Petrovsky Seaton, whether it's role or not, again, was just sort of in and out of the side. So we took some low risk, potentially medium reward um, acquisitions in those boys. And uh, unfortunately, none of them are guaranteed to be on the list in 12 months from now. Generally speaking, you know, it's probably evident this year as well that the key cogs of our next premiership tilt probably haven't even been drafted yet. And it's hard to say that, you know, Campbell Chester didn't play a single game. He's probably one of the more talented under 21s on our list, probably the number one in terms of talent as well. But while we have some youth now, and I'll, I'll touch on that in the positives, um, it was really evident that we, you know, we don't have the next Andy Brasher on our list yet. We still got to draft it. So that was a stark realization this year that even though we drafted well last year, it's just going to be a long road to getting this side to being in premiership contention once again. Another negative is probably just the waffle side this year as well. And it's hard to put too much criticism on them because of the, obviously the AFL in injuries that we copped meant that we had almost our entire waffle side playing at the AFL level meant that was probably three to four AFL listed players playing in the waffle each week with a bunch of sort of amateur level players that the waffle sides used to to top up their list. Essentially what it meant is that the waffle side got walloped every week by about 100 points. They won one game for the year, I think. And I think in our last game, kick one goal five. Or one of the second last games, we kicked one goal five for the total score. Point being here is that it's not a great place to develop your youth. You know, someone like a Jack Williams in his first year, nowhere near really ready for AFL level, but he's playing in a side that's getting annihilated at waffle level too. So hopefully that can be sort of remedied with less injuries next year when we've got a stronger side week to week, but it wasn't a great year to develop the, the real youth playing in the waffle this year. And to sum up the negatives with one point, it was just a real stark sort of illustration of where we're at as a list. It's good in a way that we, we are bottoming out and getting the access to the draft, but the list is still quite old and experienced and to be where we're at in the ladder, it's really, really disappointing. We took a punt with the Kelly deal. We tried to have another swing at a premiership. Hasn't paid off and I'm comfortable with that, but I think we learned this year that it's going to be a long, long way up. Now we got the negatives out of the way, let's talk a little bit about some positives. I think the biggest one is you contrast 2022 to 2021, and you, you can actually see that we have some young kids on the list. Like 2021, we barely had anyone to pick, 
and the ones we did were probably injured, someone like a Luke Edwards. But now, after what I would describe as a pretty good draft haul in 2021, uh, we've got some players like Jai Cully, uh, mid-season draft pick, played four games this year. That's somewhat of a positive. Hoff played 15 games. Bazo played nine games. He looks like he's part of the furniture down back. Uh, and then nine games to Callum Jamison. I would never have picked that at the start of the year. And I was surprised with his endeavor. He's, he's pretty lightly built. Nowhere near being physically ready for AFL level, but at times, you know, it looked better than Williams. And Williams also played 17 games as well. So out of this year, we've actually got, you know, five or so players there where you're like, oh, okay, I can see you being a long-term player for the Eagles. To add to that positive, you know, the fact that we even have Jai Cully on the list is a uh, is a big plus as well. Obviously, being bottom of the ladder mid-season meant we had the first pick in the mid-season draft. It allowed us to draft Jai Cully, who, you know, is projected, well, would, was projected to go anywhere between 20 and 30 this year. So it's like scoring an extra second round draft pick. And geez, we really, really need the kids on the list. So I'd say that's a big positive. I think, you know, his ceiling is... Uh, it's unclear what it is, but I think his his floor at AFL level in terms of how good he can be is fairly high. I think he's at the very least going to be a tough inside midfielder, tackling machine, uses the ball well. I think we've got a long-term player in Jai Kelly. Another positive has been Tom Barris. Uh, I keep saying Barras, but I believe it's actually Barris. Um, he's emerged to be one of the best players in the competition. In fact, in that last six weeks of the season, and from what I saw, I was streaming Eagles games overseas, he could have been the best player key back in the league and you know non-Eagles fans will probably you know cringe at that but generally in that six weeks period I don't I, I think I haven't even seen McGovern play as well as Barras played in that uh, six week period so he narrowly missed out on all Australian this year and that's understandable over it's a 23 week long season um, but either way he's going into next year is one of the best players in his position and uh, I'm really really impressed and proud of how good that guy has become I'll nominate as well Kennedy and Hearn the the veterans played outstanding this year. Shannon Hearn looks like he can play for two or three more. Is that what we need as a list? Won't talk about that right now. But either way, still such a good player. And Josh Kennedy, what a champion as well. Going out, kicking eight goals in his final game for the club. Uh, what a remarkable effort. He's still such a good player at his age, playing with one leg, basically, and still kicking eight goals against Adelaide. Uh, absolute champion. He will be missed. I'll nominate Luke Shuey as a positive this year as well. Obviously, I'm a big Shuey fanboy. I, I think there's been a huge amount of disrespect on this guy who's really struggled to get his body right. And as such, the, um, I don't know, cannibalistic Eagles fans have turned on him a little bit. And um, I, I think it's been really disappointing. You know, some people are calling him the worst captain we've ever had. And I don't get me started on how unfair I think that is to put the last three years on one player. But he's come back in, sort of reinvented himself as a more of a tough in and under midfielder, not really using his pace because his hamstrings have, are made of twine. But twine? Is twine strong? Something that breaks easy. No, but at 32 years of age, he's not going to be an All-Australian level midfielder. I think he's coming in and, and playing a role for his side and he's tough. His, his effort level has been good. I think he's a positive. And the fact that he's played, what, 15 games this year is a positive. I'd say the reinvention of Jermaine Jones as a running defender was also a positive this year. How long-term is he going to be in that role? Not too sure, but you could really see the difference when a guy with his speed and skill went into the back line and we started playing a lot more direct footy. Yes, he made a lot of mistakes, but one thing we've been crying out for as Eagles fans has been playing a more aggressive style, particularly from the back half. And uh, I think he's somewhat entrenched in the best 22 right now. Like I said... Three years from now, no idea if he's going to be in the side, but definitely a positive. He played really well this year. And just overall, a clear change mid-season in terms of our, you know, our game style and our tackling and intensity and our overall endeavor. Got a lot better in the second half of the year, and unfortunately, it didn't really translate to wins. It would have been nice to have you know, three or four at the end of the year, and we were unlucky in some games. You know, Could have beaten Adelaide, and uh, I'm sure there's another game in there where we were pretty close, but not quite good enough. Uh, but either way, I think the way we were playing in the back end of this year was better than 2021. So in some ways we took some steps. So that's probably all the negatives and positives that I'd care to really go into in this video. We'll talk briefly about the off season and what that holds and I will be doing more off season content generally, but obviously I'm gonna do some Eagles videos as well because we are hopefully gonna be in the thick of it this year with uh, such a good draft hand. But I think one positive is now that we, ha we actually have the draft position that reflects how bad we were. So last year, we finished ninth and our first pick was 12, I think. We traded back to 14. This year, we have picked two um, and we were only slightly worse than we were at the end of 2021. So uh, I think we go into this year with the following draft picks, two, 20, 26, 
and 38, and that could improve um, with the likely loss of Junior Rioli. We can talk a little bit about Rioli now. It seems, as I record this video, he's going to go to Port Adelaide to undergo a medical, um, and I, I believe it's been reported the Eagles have given, or at least the players have given their blessing for him to do what's best for his family. So to me, that's the writing on the wall. He's probably leaving the Eagles. Now, this is a tricky one. I understand both schools of thought um, when they view the potential Rioli trade. Now, there is a strong school of thought that he's kind of betraying us a little bit because we stood by him when he got banned for two years. Um, we kept him on the list. I have no idea if we were paying him much, if at all. Uh, but either way, you know, showed some real loyalty there by keeping him on the list. And to be fair, he probably hasn't repaid that loyalty with some of his conduct over the last, you know, even the last 12 months. I think he got into trouble once again. And this talk about low, did I just burp? Sorry. There's been talk about average training standards and stuff like that. I personally am a little bit more easy going on it because I look at a guy who is frankly a sick player and I know he didn't have a great year this year but he is still a fantastic player and would be a very very important player I reckon he could waltz into any team in the league right now and be a key part of their finals campaign he's such a good player and he's going to be turning 28 next year I believe he's got kids in fact he's got at least one he might even have two and this is a guy who has been drafted late and probably never been paid a big contract. Let's be real. It, AFL players have such a short lifespan in the AFL, and that's when they get drafted at 18, right? So when a player gets drafted at 21, has two years out, this guy's got to maximize how much revenue he can generate over the next three or four years. And I actually respect his decision if he decides, okay, Port Adelaide's paying me a bucket load. I'm going to go play for them. Yes, it's not the most loyal thing, but if there's a big difference in how much money he can make at another club, I, I say I back him in. Just do what's right for you, mate. And uh, and from an Eagles position as well, he's literally one of my favorite players. But as a 27 going on 28-year-old player next year, he's not really what we need right now. So other than the sentimental factor, I think this could, as much as it kills me, be the best thing for all parties involved. What do we get for him? That remains to be seen. I can understand why his value would be at an all-time low. Um, I know Port Adelaide are likely to get an end of first round for Carl Amon as part of their free agency compensation. I can understand why they don't want to pay that for a player who's missed out two years and then didn't play that well this year. But if we somehow jag a top 25 pick out of this, then I would say then we've been compensated enough for me to let it go. There is a chance we get absolute peanuts for him. Uh, I guess that will all play out. Bailey Williams could also be headed back to Victoria, uh, which is an unfortunate thing because he's played 17 games this year. And again, there's some mixed thoughts on Williams. I'm still optimistic. I think he needs a good number one ruck for him to support. He played a couple of really good games this year and then some average form as well, but he's a young guy. But he might head back to Victoria for, I don't know, a nominal draft pick. Maybe Melbourne comes into the mix there with their likely losing Jackson. Not too sure, but that's another way we could potentially get another top 50 pick. I don't really know what he's worth, but it wouldn't be much more than that. Looking at our list generally, I think one thing I've noticed is we're looking a little bit over-contracted. We've rewarded some average players with some reasonable length contracts and as such it makes it hard for us to to really pick some delistings this year a couple of players i'll i'll mention who probably would be delisted this year if they didn't have another contract or at least one year to go on a contract uh luke foley would be in the firing line i think xavier o'neill might be safe he finished the year pretty well uh, Josh Rotham as well. I think he signed a three-year deal last year, and that's looking iffy because he's barely you know, in the best 22. In fact, I'd say he's not in the best 22. And Zach Lagnon, we recruited him on a three-year contract, and I think if he had a two-year deal, he wouldn't be getting another one this year. So four players there that are contracted for another year that we would probably ideally like to move on, in my opinion, uh, which really hamstrings us you know, strategically this offseason. We have to wait another year. You can cut their contract short and pay them out, but that's expensive. Um, and obviously there's the risk that they come on and, and be a good player somewhere else. Again, my intention was not to get too bogged down into the um, the list management stuff. I will make spe specialized videos on those. Uh, but I think this year, all we can really do is take our five draft picks. We may trade pick two down for an extra second round pick, uh, you know, six and 24 versus pick two on its own. Who knows? Uh, but I think next year as well, we need to keep an eye on the fact that we're going to have a lot of retirements, a lot of players coming out of contract. We're probably going to be taking six, seven, eight picks in next year's draft as it currently stands. So I actually think we should try and look at improving next year's draft position. So maybe a future pick for Rioli would be a good start. Uh, I think just over the next coming years, you just need to flood the list with 18 year old kids um, with, you know, a lot of potential, ideally, you know, picked in the first two to three rounds. 
Uh, and then probably by 2024 is when we look at what can we do in terms of free agency. Personally, I think we'll go hard at Tim English in a couple of years time, but at the moment, probably don't have the cash to splash. Finally, I'll end the video with a bit of an outlook for next season. Um, it's tough to peg exactly how we're going to go. I'd probably start with a new captain, and that's not because I don't think Luke shuey has been good. But you have to consider the fact that next year, you know, we've re-signed Nat Nui, Hearn, Shuey, Redden, Cripps. Like, these guys are all going to be playing on next year. And we're going to need to cycle some players through the waffle. Some of these guys will need to be rested periodically. And therefore, I think Shuey probably needs to pass on the captaincy or at least, you know, have it passed on for him so that we can, you know, take the punt on resting him regularly uh, or playing him in the back line, playing him in the waffle. It's hard to do that to your captain. So I actually think Tom Barras is probably the... I think he's earned it. I think he's playing like a captain. He's playing like a champion. Uh, that's probably where I'd start. And then just generally, like I said, move those guys through the waffle regularly because we don't want to have a year where we get nowhere near finals and we're rolling in with the same starting center square combo every week of Shuey, Red, and Kelly. Um, I mean, injuries will probably dictate our selection process anyway. Uh, but either way, I think that needs to be the focus. I'm happy with those guys signing on, but we really need to not hamper guys like Jai Cully, Luke Edwards next year, Xavier O'Neill, hopefully, if he if he starts to find some momentum, and of course, pick two, whoever and that ends up being. Fully fit next year. Let's say we have a good preseason and uh, everyone's got a good foot fitness base. The waffle side's cranking with some regular availability too. I can see us being a lot more competitive. And I think overall... I do expect this to be the lowest point of the rebuild. And I don't know if that seems like a big call, but I don't think it is when your side's just played a 2-20 in season. So I'm hoping we're not as uncompetitive as this year. Even with a bit of momentum and some luck, um, it's hard to put us anywhere near final. So I think bottom six looms again, but the real focus needs to be fitness, getting games into the young kids, uh, and just make sure we're not getting annihilated every week because that's not great for development. So if we're somewhere on an Adelaide nev level next year in terms of not really anywhere near finals, but looking like we're showing progress, I think that would be a great outcome. And uh, yeah, hopefully we're going to have four to five new draft picks this year in addition to five taken last year. Pick two comes into the side, Campbell Chester comes into the side, suddenly we've got some real pace. Um, I'm optimistic, I'm always going to be optimistic, but again, I can't see us climbing out of the bottom six, and that's probably the best thing for this side right now is get access to draft picks. So there you have it, guys. That is my view on the Eagles 2022 season. I hope it didn't bang on too long. It certainly went on longer than I expected, but I guess I had more to say than I realized. So uh, let me know in the comments, Eagles fans, uh, what you agree with and disagree with and what's something you're excited for next year. And whether you go for the Eagles or not, let me know where you expect us to finish next year. I always like having a non-Eagles perspective um, and because it's always a bit unemotional unless they go for free battle. Uh, but yeah, let us know what you think of our list and uh, who you want us to draw as well if you are into the draft and such so thanks for sticking through to this point of the video guys appreciate all your support lately um i, I know i haven't i've been pretty absent this year um but finals around the corner draft and trade draft and trade is where the channel sort of blew up last year so i'm going to give it a good crack so thanks guys and i will see you in the next video cheers